uh, welcome to the session uh, 6G standardization activities. I am Rajesh Kapoor, technical consultant, SDSS, TSDSI, and convener of this particular session. Uh, this session is, uh, uh, can you uh, put the next slide, Chandrakanta? Uh, this session shall focus on some of the 6G standardization activities ongoing in international SDOs like ITU, IEEE, 3GPP, along with the potential technical advancements which may play an important role in 6G. ITUR Study Group 5 has adopted the framework of IMT 2030 and beyond, which defined usage scenarios as well as capabilities of the 6G networks. The session focuses on potential areas such as immersive communication, hyper-reliability and low-latency communications, AI ML, sensing communication, and Euclidus. Uh, connectivity address how these contributions towards building the next generation networks. So there are certain hygienic uh, instructions for the conduct of this particular session that the uh, uh, um, audience will be on mute throughout the session and uh, speakers that uh, they can post their question, the uh, question answer questions in the question answer tab. And uh, this particular session will be recorded and will be available on the website of TSDSI. All these hygienic instructions are available in the chat box also. And you may go through the instructions and uh, uh, accordingly you can uh, uh, act upon uh, talking to your uh, colleagues as well, uh, the audience. Uh, uh, and this particular session, kindly next slide. Uh, this session will be... Uh, uh, the schedule will be that there are going to be seven speakers, including uh, the co-chairs. And these eminent speakers, they will be speaking on all the subjects of uh, 6G standardization and research challenges uh, uh, which are there uh, while getting on with the 6G activities. So uh, uh, this session, kindly next slide, please. So this session, the co-chairs are Mr. VK Roy, uh, the DDG uh, DOT uh, and Shweta Kiran from IIT Bombay. Next slide, please. The, Mr. Roy, he is a seasoned telecommunication expert serving as DDG uh, standards, uh, research and innovation in the Department of Telecommunication, Government of India. He holds BTEC degree in electronics and uh, engineering from REC, Calicut, Kerala, and MBA with dual specialization in internal business and finance. Shweta Kiran has 12 years of experience uh, in uh, de develop ops, engineering, and over uh, six years, she has been in the, uh, she's having uh, R&D experience in wireless net networks and uh, actively contributing to 3GPP, ITU, TSDA type. She is currently working as senior project officer in the Department of Electrical Engineering, IIT Bombay. So I hand over the proceedings to Mr. Roy for, with, uh, for opening remarks and further conduct of this particular session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rajesh Kapoor. Am I audible, I think? Hello, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah. We are. Thank you. Thank you. So, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. I think uh, Professor Kiran is in time zone of USA. So, morning time will be there. We are starting this 60 astonishing activities today, just after finalization of ITUT study group 5 meeting. This is very important, very relevant also. We all know externalization is a shared vision for global good for any sector, whether it is telecom or anything else. It is a framework of agreements for all stakeholders to ensure the creation of a well-defined, well-performing systems, products and services in accordance with set guidelines. What is the objective of standardization? 
to have best product, to have compatibility, to have interoperability, safety, security, quality. That is the, but always we should keep in mind, this is a shared vision and the framework is a shared framework. Uh, when we talk about the ITU, IMT 2030 framework. So next slide, please. What is the target and the motivation for uh, this IMT 2030 framework, which has been just uh, adopted by the ITU, to have an inclusive information society towards contributing to support the UN SDGs. And uh, we are happy to share that to have this sustainable development goal to mitigate the digital divide. India has contributed one of the huge scenario and finally it has been adopted that is nothing but ubiquitous connectivity. So all huge scenario which has been finalized in the I2 study go 5 now from now on standard development organization like 3GPP will be developing technology that satisfies the region suggested by 6G framework and uh, which will be submitted to ITUR as a candidate technology. Next slide, please. So this slide shows to build inclusive information society supporting SDGs. So what is expectation from IMT 2030, 6G? It should be a enabler for achieving the given goals like inclus inclusivity, ubiquitous connectivity, enhance security and resilience even it should work in the disaster. It should be resilient one, standardization and interoperability, interworking to have the sim uh, seamless connectivity. We could, uh, we, uh, it should support non-IMT network also, sustainability, innovation. These are the goals for the IMT 2030. Next slide, please. We all understand these are the user and application trends we have discussed in ITU, like ubiquitous intelligence throughout by using AI, ML, by using ubiquitous comp uh, computing. So proper use of AI, ML can make the network, I think, uh, capable of taking many decisions which are at present being taken by manpower. But this is going to be in future in uh, with the help of IMT 2030, with the help of the capabilities of IMT 30, uh, 30, many applications which are, which we envisage for the IMT 2030, I think that is possible like a smart industrial application, digital health and well-being, metaverse, immersive multimedia, integration of sensing and communication. Uh, certainly this uh, sensing and communication, uh, we are happy that uh, we are going to have a lab in India also on integration of sensing and communication very soon. Sustainability, energy efficiency, this was also a contribution from uh, Indian side. Coverage, sustainability and uh, interoperability as a capability was contribution from Indian side. Next slide, please. So these are the technological trends. I think uh, we, 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 we should have consideration of enhance the radio interface, how to enhance the radio networks, what are the technological en enablers, studies on technology feasibility of IMT in bands over the 100 gigahertz, and spectrum harmonization. These are the technological trends for the IMT 2030. Next slide, please. These are the envisage frequency bands. Certainly, uh, it is envisage that IMT 2030, similar to previous IMT system, would be used in variety of deployment. So I think spectrum bands are also very important in next slide, we'll see. Next slide, please. 
these are the frequency bands so to utilize a wide range of frequency band ranging from sub one uh, sub one gigahertz to frequency range band above 100 gigahertz this all may be considered for imt 2030 certainly low band will continue to be crucial to enable nationwide coverage but at the same time in um, mid band provide a balance between wide area coverage and capacity and the high band certainly for the high throughput and coverage next slide so these are the huge scenario ubiquitous connectivity and uh, now pentagon has converted into hexagon and ubiquitous connectivity is one of the important user scenario for at least for the developing country for whole global not uh, I, I should say for the uh, developing country for the whole global good because this will have the enhanced uh, coverage in uh, i think uh, terrestrial network so our target is have to mitigate the digital divide to fill the gap between rural and urban there should not be exodus by 2030 our target is that uh, there should there should be equal financial and other opportunity available in rural and urban part of any country that is the i think uh, purpose of uh, this user scenario many user scenarios uh, are there and I, I think speakers will be talking about that so next slide please so these are the related capabilities six capabilities have been added and uh, many are uh, enhanced from the imt 2020 so six capabilities including coverage sustainability interoperability these are the new capabilities of imt 2030 that will be discussed by the speakers next slide please so uh, there should be uh, certainly there is um, a relationship between imt 20 other access system and uh, uh, that is required to be maintained backward compatibility and relation with other access system uh, even 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 for uh, non imt system that is required to be maintained next slide please so at uh, present we are having the uh, 5g and uh, 6g is imt 2030 so there is relation everything should be enhanced but backward compatibility should be there this is this is the requirement for the uh, imt 2030 next slide please what is the timeline i think in next slide that is the timeline is shown we have uh, completed the framework after that the technical performance requirement uh, will be uh, completed and uh, then uh, pre standardization work uh, will start and standardization activity will st start in 3gpp and other sdos and uh, finally the standard development and deployment will have happen by 2030 this is the timeline for 6g horizon so this is the context setting rather uh, uh, i think uh, the in detail uh, speakers will be talking about uh, different use scenario and other related capabilities next slide many interrelated factors are there to say non imt system should also be uh, i think there should be interworking between the uh, imt system and non imt system so such type of interrelated factors are there next slide please so what are the focus area for further study radio interface standards development these are the focus area and uh, access network related issues traffic characteristic spectrum related issues these are the important for any mobile to, uh, to, uh, um, uh, mobile technology so uh, these are nothing but even we are following the same thing in the earlier generation but here again we are required to have more focus on the radio interface standards development access network related issues traffic characteristic spectrum related issues and integration of um, i think uh, ai ml uh, intelligence pervasive intelligence uh, computation in the imt 2030 next slide so these are all uh, about the uh, imt 2030 framework which uh, which is finalized in the recent it2 study itr study group 5 i think based on this further the development of standards will happen in 3gpp number two so this is all about thank you very much
now i uh, request uh, professor kiran uh, for covering his topic on ubiquitous connectivity so this is a very important uh, topic for terrestrial network because this will have a uh, enhancement of coverage in the desired area it has effect on affordability also it has effect on capex also it has effect on digital divide also so and what are the r and d requirements you will be um, by having this ubiquitous connectivity he will be delivery uh, he will be talking about that so over to mr uh, kiran kuchi professor kiran kuchi please thank you thank you sir uh, can you hear me sir yes loud and clear uh uh first uh, first of all uh, i i want to congratulate the entire uh, uh, dot department of telecommunications tec and uh, wpc team uh, for uh, accomplishing this uh, um, you know this monumental feat of uh, introducing uh, uh, india specific uh, requirements into the uh, itu working party 5d imt 2030 plus vision and uh, uh, framework document uh while we all celebrated last few weeks uh, on these matters uh, in fact uh, you know uh, mr vikaroy and team has been working very diligently to ensure these contributions are permanently cemented in the uh, in the itu uh, uh, processes um uh, they practically had to move a mountain to get this thing done um so now that uh, this is uh, confirmed by uh, study group 5 this uh, um this diagram shown here uh, we can safely move forward uh, to actually work on the technology um so today i will talk about uh, ubiquitous connectivity uh, which is uh, one of the prime uh, 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 features uh, usage scenarios introduced in uh, Uh, working party 5d framework document and it really uh, took quite a bit of an effort on the part of uh, indian administration uh, to introduce this usage scenario and i believe it will have profound impact uh, when imt 2030 services are delivered worldwide um so the primary motivation uh, stems from the fact that uh, there are 3.4 billion people live in uh, rural areas out of which uh, nearly 500 million people Uh, live, uh, uh, rural citizens live in india and nearly 3.5 billion people do not have, have access to connectivity while there are underlying economic considerations here uh, we will only talk about uh, 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 technology related aspects in this presentation uh, many people must keep wondering what is ubiquitous connectivity while the uh, name itself is self explanatory Uh, can Hello? you please share your screen professor kiran sorry to interrupt can you please share your screen the, your slides are not visible thank you mr vikar i it's not visible no, it's not not visible sir. can you share your screen first then ah okay something happened looks like okay um your video is coming but the slide is not visible my apologies yeah uh something happened there okay should be coming up yeah yeah perfect sir thank you okay so i'll move on um uh i i think uh, uh the from a technical standpoint uh, uh, there are probably many questions uh, for uh, especially researchers and uh, technology developers uh, what is the research target of ubiquitous connectivity Uh, the views presented here are pre are mostly uh, my own views uh, in the you know as a faculty working on these research targets uh, but i think uh, uh, you know they could be fairly relevant to what we intend to accomplish in imt 2030 uh, itu has given uh, a certain uh, uh, if not the definition but uh, but certain uh, text uh, which is uh, visible in this as a second line in the screen Uh, uh about uh, broadband extended coverage including sparsely populated areas um so but uh, at the same time there has to be a 
uh, research target for technology development. So I, I personally have set a particular target for my own research, which I will explain in the subsequent slides. The text that is highlighted uh, here uh, uh, says that um, uh, we intend to achieve high speed broadband coverage. Well, we can define what is the speed uh, as, as we move along. Uh, in a sparsely populated area um, uh, that is located uh, within anywhere from 10 to 50 kilometer from the fiber drop point. Okay. Uh, this is uh, my own research target. Uh, I think it's a fairly ambitious one. Uh, and you will see some evidence that uh, this, this is possible, uh, at least from a um, uh, research standpoint based on the studies conducted so far. Uh, uh, and pro probably we need to do more studies and experimentation to ensure that these research targets are achievable. Uh, then the second question is how to achieve ubiquitous connectivity? Well, there are two paths to it. One is uh, uh, we are talking about a terrestrial system here. So a terrestrial system with uh, large coverage. Okay, I will address that part uh, using certain simulation results. And, uh, and ITU acknowledges that NTN will be a complementary service. NTN is a non-terrestrial network, primarily Leo Geo kind of satellite communication service. Um, and uh, uh, it is understood that uh, there is a big push towards uh, non-terrestrial and space-based communication. Uh, while you can ensure coverage anywhere on uh, anytime, anywhere, but uh, NTN is not something you know that is a replacement for terrestrial. Uh, you can't get the kind of capacities we achieve in cellular networks, right? Because there is a fiber drop every uh, two, three hundred meters in urban areas, and, uh, and and NTN is something that cannot keep up with that. Uh, so it is going to be a complementary service. So I will talk about uh, uh, three aspects uh, uh, in addition to integration with NTN. Uh, that uh, uh, that uh, aims to achieve uh, uh, the so-called large terrestrial coverage. The three ingredients uh, are uh, uh, there is a need for a uh, power efficient uh, signal transmission. Uh, that is, utilize all the power available, uh, almost all the power available in radiating the signal as opposed to uh, dissipating uh, as heat in the radio transmission equipment. This calls for a waveform that is highly power efficient. Uh, I will mention that briefly some details. Uh, there is also a need to uh, use a very large number of antenna elements uh, from the radio transmission equipment, primarily because you know we are moving to uh, uh, mid band and upper mid band and even higher frequencies, uh, uh, you know, uh, within 6G framework. So uh, this plays a crucial role. So you need new antenna technologies and uh, new radio technologies incorporating extremely large antenna arrays, um, not just large antenna arrays, but extremely large arrays. I will also talk about uh, a third element, which is crucial. Uh, a single link, a single isolated link uh, may not be able to uh, offer the kind of uh, coverage uh, um, uh, envisaged um, uh, uh, that I explained in the previous slide. So we may need to utilize multiple wireless links as a chain of relay. Uh, these are the three key ingredients. Uh, I will briefly touch upon them uh, in the limited time we have here. Uh, apart from you know uh, some comments on what kind of integration that we can expect to see between terrestrial and uh, NTN. Uh, there is a white paper that uh, has been uh, published uh, uh, very recently. I have given a uh, link to that. Uh, those interested in the technical uh, details uh, can uh, go through the white paper. The more <coughs> details are available. Um, there is a new waveform that we are uh, uh, working on, uh, something called orthogonal time frequency division multiplexing. Um, without going into too many details, uh, from a layman point of view, or rather a simplistic point of view, um, this is a new waveform that combines uh, the essential uh, features of uh, something called TDMA, which was used in uh, you know earlier generations, and uh, it also uh, utilizes the concepts of OFDM, 
and um, constructs a new waveform uh, that sort of takes the best from the both uh, uh, in a very unique manner. Uh, so the structure is illustrated here. And the net result is that you can achieve uh, uh, high power efficiency. And also, you know, uh, there is a requirement of achieving extremely low latencies uh, in 6G, which is called hyper low latency transmission mode. Both can be achieved using this new waveform. Um, the paper uh, that we published has more details on the performance aspects of this paper. Now, uh, I talked about three ingredients. The first is uh, a waveform. Um, the second uh, aspect of uh, 6G is that uh, because of the need to move to higher frequency bands, uh, at least upper mid band, something like 7 to 8 gigahertz or 7 to 10 gigahertz range, uh, there is a there is a need to um, uh, increase the link budget, the link margin. Um, so uh, the, the one of the ways in which you can achieve this while keeping the data rate targets is to use a large number of uh, antenna elements. What is shown here is in 2.4 gigahertz. It's an illustrative example. Uh, certain experiments have been conducted in the IIT Hyderabad campus. We already showed the possibility of reaching 100 bits per second per hertz uh, in a 360 degree cell site. Uh, that is one way of exploiting these antennas. The other way is use all these elements to increase coverage uh, using highly directional beams. So this requires a, a new type of uh, hardware and uh, uh, software and uh, maybe radio access uh, uh, technology uh, as we move towards 6G. Uh, I'll skip this slide. This is uh, some net, certain network simulation results that confirm that uh, you can achieve uh, at least 100 bits per second per hertz uh, in 6G. Uh, uh, that is almost uh, four, uh, nearly five-fold improvement over 5G, um, this uh, using uh, very large antenna elements. Uh, I will spend uh, a little time here uh, on this particular uh, research result. Uh, we have uh, estimated the coverage of 6G in new frequency bands using extremely large antenna arrays uh, in, an, uh, in a typical rural setting. Uh, what is shown here is that at a distance of 10 kilometers, you can achieve a 30 dB signal to noise ratio uh, in a line of sight uh, situation. Uh, whereas uh, um, uh, in a, in a non-line of sight situation, you can uh, at a distance of 5 kilometers from the cell site, you can achieve 17 to 18 dB signal to noise ratio. Uh, with a bandwidth of 250 megahertz in uh, center frequency of 7 gigahertz, uh, so-called 7 to 8 gigahertz band. But of course, the effective radiated power is 85 dBm EARP. Uh, this uh, comes uh, from the use of uh, large antenna element, large number of antenna elements. So the, the moral of the story is that one can build cell, uh, <coughs> a cell site with 5 to 10 kilometer range uh, using uh, uh, new uh, new radio access uh, technologies. Uh, so that leads to uh, the key question, the notion of ubiquitivity. That is an isolated area uh, uh, or population living in, uh, in rural and isolated area. Uh, can they benefit from 6G uh, even though the nearest fiber drop is, let's say, 50 kilometers away? The answer is uh, uh, seems to be yes. Uh, if you use a combination of FR1, FR2, FR3, and a chain of relays, uh, a single isolated link itself is capable of 5 to 10 kilometer, kilometer range with 6G kind of data rates. So this is uh, this is something that could be considered. Uh, it's a chain of relays uh, as a potential solution for a terrestrial coverage. Uh, I'm ready to close my talk. Um, uh, finally, uh, what kind of integration can be expected with uh, uh, non-terrestrial networks? Well, uh, we also, I mean, there are base stations with NTN backhaul uh, that is available today. And in 6G, you know, when NTN, uh, uh, next generation NTN comes into picture, base stations can benefit from that. But I think that more can be done. Uh, a classical UV or CPE can switch between terrestrial and SATCOM mode. In fact, we have some experience building such uh, systems for narrowband IoT. But SATCOM and uh, uh, terrestrial are offered on a single chip. Uh, it's a reality today. Uh, likewise, uh, 6G class of CPEs can switch between terrestrial and uh, and uh, and NTN. For example, for home broadband access, uh, this is quite possible. Uh, I mean, this is another way of reaching ubiquitousness, uh, uh, expanding the terrestrial coverage, 
taking it to the limits and um, and uh, falling back to NTN where, uh, where there is no coverage at all. I'll stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm done here. Thank you. So, Madam Sweta Kiran, have you received any questions? No, sir, we don't have any questions. So, uh, I have a question. If uh, <laughs> you don't have any question, so what is uh, integration uh, between non-terrestrial network and uh, your terrestrial network uh, tightly integrated you were talking about? So, tightly integrated means what? Sir, tightly integrated, not in terms of uh, radio access technology. Okay. From in terms of radio access technology, it is uh, interworking. That's assumption. But tightly tight integration is in terms of device. That is, uh, if I have a, I mean, a simple example is I have a phone. It can uh, it connects to a terrestrial operator when there is a service and uh, when there is terrestrial service, and falls back to uh, space communication when there is no service. Uh, and uh, this fallback can be uh, like between Wi-Fi and uh, you know cellular or something like that. So uh, where NTN is a uh, uh, is a complementary service, but the device, uh, as far as the phone de or device is concerned, it is tightly integrated in hardware and uh, device point of view. From a network point of view, it is interworking. Okay, so it is in line with the I uh, IMT twenty thirty framework, I think. Right. So we want to stick to the framework as you know, without any deviation whatsoever, as as agreed in IMT twenty thirty. So thank you very much, Professor Kiran, for your uh, did, uh, one of the important topics, uh, ubiquitous connectivity, because this was added this time only, and this is for the global good. And uh, uh, you were also a force behind this. You're uh, really. And you had a very you give, yeah you have given a very good talk on that. So is there any Thank question? You. You, Still, uh, any I think question we have a there? long way to go. Or otherwise, you can uh, write on the chat box so that uh, it can be replied later on also. So if, if, if any question is there. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kiran. Now, next speaker is uh, Ms. Devaki Chandramali. Yes, uh, this is the, <clears throat> I think, uh, her profile. I have uh, met uh, Madam Devaki in the last 3GPP meeting in Cochin, and she was very active. She is a Bell Lab Fellow and the head of the North American Association with Nokia. She is currently a co chair for Next Alliance Steering Group. She is also an ASA2 delegate, reporter, and the leader of the 5G system architecture specific in 3GPP. He has laid many 3GPP work items as a reporter. I have uh, read her article in IEEE on uh, time sensitive network. That was a very good article. So um, uh, I think without taking much time, I uh, invite uh, Madam Devaki Chandramali on her talk uh, on, uh, on her talk on immersive communication in 6G. Really, immersive communication is, uh, I think, uh, one of the user scenario of the system. So that will be very interesting. How meta was? What is meta was? Whether it is a fixed physical extension of the physical world? How the cyber physical and um, digital convergence is there? So over to Madam Devki Chandramon. Thank you for your kind introduction, sir. Thank. You. I'm really honored to be here, to be able to present to you all. I will share my slides. Yes, thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Uh, my talk will be about uh, immersive communication and evolution from 5G towards 5G advanced towards uh, 6G and also provide some insights on the global collaboration activities and insights on the timeline for 6G standards. And
Now, uh, starting with the goals for our future society, uh, we believe with uh, 6G, we can actually um, uh, move from connectedness to towards togetherness and also from information to knowledge and from efficiency to purpose. So what do we really mean by those? With togetherness, uh, we mean people should be connected and people can be connected and not just in their smartphones, but rather uh, in real life and where they have access to information. And with knowledge, it, information is no longer enough. We need a greater understanding. We need more intelligence, uh, cognitive and complete context awareness, leveraging the digital twin, sensing and other technologies. Uh, with regards to purpose, what do we really mean by that? In the past, technology has helped us become more efficient. Now we need to have, try to hand over the mundane task to the machines and actually work on and focus on items that really matter to us and our planet. Now, what is the metaverse? Metaverse is an immersive digital experience that connects people, places, things, and information in real time in such a way that it enhances the physical world. And that is how it helps connect people better. And there are three types of metaverse, uh, the uh, industrial metaverse, enterprise metaverse, and the consumer metaverse. With the industrial and the enterprise metaverse, they improve uh, productivity, uh, help reduce cost, reduce system downtime, and also improve energy efficiency and, <clears throat> and help us do tasks virtually that would require in-person interaction today. Uh, while consumer metaverse is more about uh, entertainment, gaming, and uh, uh, and consumer-related uh, activities. And here it is more about improved experience while it is less about um, uh, improving productivity on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, in the subsequent slides, we will also show why we believe, you know, we are the enterprise and the industrial metaverse have a key role in the near future compared to the consumer metaverse. So, uh, yeah, as I said earlier, in the near future, we believe uh, the mass scale deployment can be expected with the industrial and the uh, enterprise metaverse. Uh, one main reason is also because of the device availability and the cost of affordability. Over here, the, uh, the prices are affordable from an industry perspective or an enterprise perspective or the organization perspective. While the consumer metaverse is still in the early adopter phase, uh, the, the challenge here is the, uh, is the price factor, especially from the device perspective. And here we need some technology breakthrough in order to see massive scale deployments. And this is also why we see, uh, why we believe industrial metaverse and the consumer metaverse can be deployed in mass scale in the near future compared to the consumer metaverse. Now talking about the industrial metaverse or the industrial automation, it can be explained in three simple steps. First, it is about sensing, capturing the physical world. And the second, it's about understanding and extracting uh, industrial analytics and performing analytics. And then the third step is about acting, executing on the actionable insights that we have derived from the analytics. And then it's a feedback loop. We act and then we sense, we understand, and we act. So with regards to capturing the physical world, what are the practical examples here? It can be about taking accurate inventory or locating misplaced items or preventing theft. And that is about capturing the physical world. The uh, driving analytics here, uh, gathering all the information and use that to actually improve your efficiency, improve, uh, address the privacy risk or reduce energy consumption and increase battery life for the device or for the network or for whatever 
whatever task it is within the industry. And finally, the, the third step is in taking action through automation. And here it can be about improving the safety conditions within the work environment. And it can be about also taking audit inventory or reducing the low value manual labor and automating those tasks. So these are some of the key steps that are involved in the industrial automation. Now, how do we actually realize these uh, use cases and technologies with 5G and 6G? With uh, 5G Advance is not definitely the key stepping stone for uh, 6G use cases and the capabilities that 6G can deliver. With uh, Taking the first example, high quality video. Video is a very known use case. We have been using video since 3G days. The, uh, the improvement with video has been in the quality, uh, like in the HD video or the performance and the way we consume it and the amount of video we consume today. And with 5G Advanced, we can already expect fully immersive user experience while 6G can take it to the next level with holographic transmission. And then the second example is about digital twins. 5G Advanced and 5G can already support digital twins at a slow, smaller level. With 5G Advanced, we can already reconstruct like a vertical farm or, an, or even supply chain within a factory. But 6G can help take it to the next level where you can actually create a digital twin of the whole city or even a whole telecommunication network with its antennas and all the details. The third example use case is about uh, services beyond communication and control. With 5G and 5G Advanced, we already offer services like location positioning and timing services that complement uh, GNSS today. And we can even offer timing as a resiliency with 5G uh, Advanced Release 18 features. However, 6G can actually take it to the next level by introducing also support for sensing in internet and zero touch automation. It can actually combine all the functionalities and take localization to the next level, basically make network as the key sensor. And the subsequent slide, we show the key features that have been introduced uh, in 5G since release 15, release 16, release 17, and release 18. In a nutshell, I will not go over the specifics, but all but highlight the key features that are essential for, for uh, XR and Metaverse in the subsequent slide. The XR uh, optimization comes especially in 3GPP release 18, where we have XR optimized radio interface and the relevant features. So here we show the, the key technology enablers for XR. Uh, I would divide them into three main categories. The first category is capacity and low latency. The second category is UE power savings. And the third category is improved uh, media capabilities. With the first category, the capacity and low latency, we have improved improved uh, MIMO performance that helps with improved capacity and enhanced co uplink coverage, especially. These features have been introduced in release 18. And we also have improved scheduling algorithm that is config grant algorithm. And we have improved application awareness for uh, QoS and scheduling considering the XR traffic characteristics, like the periodicity, burst size, and uh, so on. And we also have uh, other features such as uh, L4S for congestion mitigation. With these features, uh, we can improve the capacity and low latency significantly. And finally, we also have uh, application and network interaction. Uh, closed loop interaction between the application and network interaction enables them to work in a coordinated manner that is introduced by enhancing the APIs from the, three, uh, from the NEF platform. 
For UE power savings, we have introduced several features such as enhanced DRX and CDRX cycle that takes into consideration the application traffic characteristics for the XR applications. And this helps improve the power savings for uh, the network, uh, sorry, the device. <clears throat> The power savings is actually an important feature from a XR perspective because if the UE doesn't have offer uh, optimized power savings and optimized battery, then the the end user or the headset can result in, can have heat dissipation that can result in user discomfort. This is why device power savings is extremely critical. And finally, we also have improved media and codec capabilities that uh, rounds up the capabilities that have been introduced in the uh, 5G advanced for immersive communication. And finally, from our uh, technology vision perspective, we believe the, the network and the technology uh, can be uh, transformed in such a way that it can meet the technological, the socioeconomic and the geopolitical demands of 2030. The next part of the presentation is about collaboration. And uh, our key message is to show that collaboration is key to success. Uh, so uh, in India, of course, we have the Bharat 6G Alliance and uh, we have various organizations in uh, globally in the US, uh, in Europe and China, Japan, South Korea, and uh, all working on 6G research these days. And they all identify the key technologies, key use cases that must be considered uh, for uh, the development of 6G. And uh, from Nokia perspective, we also work with academia and research institutions to actually do applied research. And these are all essential to uh, improve the, uh, the concept development during the research phase and collaboration is key for that. And here we show the, uh, the key timeline from the standards perspective. Uh, right now, the uh, ITUR work is ongoing, as you all know, and it was mentioned in the earlier presentation. But here we also show the deep dive uh, present timeline from a 3GPP perspective. Uh, the 3GPP uh, uh, SA1 work can be expected to start sometime next year. However, of course, the key timeline to focus on is the finalization of the stage three specification, which is around uh, uh, 2028 uh, timeframe, which is the end of 2028. That is when we expect the first 3GPP 6G spec to be uh, finalized. And uh, we believe uh, uh, global standards is extremely important. Uh, we should uh, speak this, the machines can have to uh, uh, speak the same language, even if we people don't speak the same language at the end, uh, which is also one reason why global standards is extremely important also for global roaming. And finally, to conclude, I would like to say uh, as a key takeaway, standards is a shared vision for a better world. And uh, if we want to go fast, go alone. And if we want to go far, we go together. Everyone should have access to clean energy education and stay safe. And from standards perspective, this implies our first step is to translate this real action with the help of uh, international standards. And we will underpin the shared vision for a better world and that is faster and also more uh, sustainable. Uh, so uh, we should work together to develop the global 60 standards for the good of the mankind. And with that, I would like to close my speech. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Any questions? Thank you so much, Ms. Devaki. That was an excellent presentation. Um, 
so far we don't have any questions but i myself had a <laughs> question for you um Definitely. so you talked about how metaverse for industry is way ahead than the um, you know for uh, than the you know um, the user realization so and you also talked about how it is closer to deployment at scale and things like that from your perspective do you think how far do you think india is and where are we on that scale of industrial automation and how soon do you think it can be actually deployed <laughs> that's just your thought <laughs> good question uh, in fact uh, you know we have uh, a small tour arranged uh, to actually see uh, the digital twin uh, within a factory in india in chennai uh, so uh, you know small steps and progress is happening already today uh, right so yes uh, I, i believe even in india we will see uh, i mean the industrial and the meta uh, enterprise metaverse use cases are extremely relevant and uh, uh, yeah this can actually help automate uh, supply chain and can actually automate uh, manufacturing uh, within factories uh, Uh, of course this is a starting point right i mean yeah it is done at a smaller scale within a supply chain within a factory but of course i, I think there are uh, yeah e india is also getting i mean uh, testing and uh, realizing the help of these use cases yes yes thank you very much yeah that that helped provide a lot of perspective thank you thanks a lot so we have another question um metaverse for education or skill development also plays a big role not mentioned here can you please clarify yes definitely metaverse for education can play a big role in fact this is one of the topic that has been covered also as part of next year alliance white paper on verticals metaverse for education uh, so uh, yeah so we i mean this we covered this in the umbrella of the consumer use cases uh, or even the enterprise use cases right I, i think that can also come under the umbrella of the enterprise use cases uh, so Uh, i mean from a consumer standpoint okay if we take education like from a every student standpoint can every student afford a expensive device i guess that is the question right but if we talk about enterprise if we talk about universities owning the devices or the schools right then that could become reality uh, i mean the main point that we were trying to convey is that the cost of the device is is too high for a consumer metaverse to be used in the uh, in a mass scale but yeah good point but yeah we covered it mainly under the enterprise or the consumer use case depending on the actual user of it. Okay thank you so much thanks a lot for your presentation and it was uh, very insightful thank you so much i'll hand it over back to mr roy for uh, the next speaker uh seems like mr roy may not be available okay um So we'll introduce our next speaker. Uh, uh, he is Professor Nilesh Mehta from IIC Bangalore. He will speak on multi-connectivity with uh, uh, from HR for HR LLC and coexistence with EMBB. He is professor and chair of the Electrical Communication uh, Department in IIC of Bengaluru. Uh, over to you, sir, for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, hello can you see my screen please yeah. yes sir thank you 
So uh, thank you, uh, everyone, and thanks to TSDSI for the invitation to uh, uh, give a talk uh, in this uh, uh, te tech deep dive. Uh, so my name is Nilesh, and uh, I'll give a slightly different kind of a talk. Um, I'm not going to, in a way, um, try to project what the requirements of 6G will be or what 6G will bring about, but uh, a more um, barren knuckles view, which is given the kind of numbers or targets 6G is imposing for uh, cellular systems, how do we achieve them? And what sort of uh, engineering and design problems do we run into? And how do we solve those problems? That's essentially the focus of my talk. So let me just start off uh, by looking and comparing 5G and 6G. So, and I've taken two very common typical figures that one would see when you talk about 5G, which is the spider chart. And you know, this was the first standard in a way that got three different, very different use cases, uh, ultra reliable low latency communications, URLLC, massive machine type communications, MMTC, and enhanced mobile broadband, EMBB together, and tried to address them all. Of course, they have very different requirements. So it plays a delicate balancing act. And I'm this talk is going to focus on the ultra reliable low latency aspect of 5G and its extension to what is now called hyper-reliable low-latency communications, which I've taken the liberty now, I'm going to call it HRLLC. Um, so uh, if you compare the two, um, you find some similarities and also some critical differences. So if you look at the kind of latencies that are being targeted, in 5G, they were talking of sub-millisecond latency, uh, just about beginning to talk about it. And that was already a pretty big leap compared to what latencies you had in 4G. Reliability, the, you see different numbers uh, for different applications, but one common number we've come across is essentially five nines reliability or essentially error, packet error rates of the order of 10 power minus five. In 6G, uh, when I look at this uh, figure that I saw in the IMT 2030 report, um, and I'm sure you've seen it multiple times today, um, they're still talking sub-millisecond latency, all right? So, um, but the, the big difference that I see now is in the reliability part. And um, they're talking of error rates of the order of 10 power minus 7. So essentially, you're looking at 7 nines uh, reliability. Now, I've put these numbers in square brackets but because from what I understand, it's still open for debate. It's not yet finalized. But uh, what I do see is a trend that they're moving towards even more reliable uh, communication requirements. Okay, so that's why it's called hyper-reliable. So now one can ask, okay, fine, these are the requirements. How does one achieve these kind of really challenging targets? And I say these are challenging because if you look at a cellular, typical cellular system, be it 3G or 4G, it's essentially designed for a packet at a rate of 10%. So essentially 90% reliability. And from there, you want to move the systems to 10 power minus 2, which is there in some control channels today, but all the way down to 10 power minus 5 and perhaps even 10 power minus 7. So the, you need to really throw new techniques at it or a combination of several techniques at it. So for example, if you look at the reliability part, be it hyper or ultra, um, the, the most natural thing is essentially retransmissions or hybrid ARQ. You, you, if your packet fails, you transmit it again and you keep doing it till your packet goes through. The second thing is essentially throw more antennas at the problem. You can use multiple transmit antennas and or multiple receive antennas. And essentially what this does is gives you what's called spatial diversity or essentially the fact that you have multiple paths now for the signal to flow from the transmitter receiver. So if for so essentially the signal will flow so long as at least one of the paths is not blocked. That's essentially the intuition behind spatial diversity. The third thing is also spatial diversity, but on a macro scale, and it's called multi-connectivity. And that's going to be one of the key topics of my talk today. So essentially you do the same thing, but now you throw the signal from multiple G node Bs or base stations. And this not only gives you protection against what's called small scale fading, but it also gives you protection against shadowing and path loss. So if even if one of the links is blocked by a building, for example, uh, there's, there might be another link that can protect you. Okay. Now, how do you achieve the low latency part? So if you look at low latency, 5G introduced this really nice thing called a mixed numerology OFDM system, uh, where essentially what they do is they no longer use the same OFDM numerology, uh, which means the subcarrier bandwidth and symbol duration they mix and match depending on the services requirements. And uh, what they did is cut essentially the OFDM symbol duration down by a factor as up to eight. So you could uh, 
So earlier, one slot, which was the basic unit of time in 4G, was one millisecond. It's been shrunk all the way down to one eighth of a millisecond in 5G. And it's easy to see why this gives you lower latency because essentially everything happens eight times faster. The other thing that's been done uh, is preemption. And, and that's again going to be one important uh, focus for this talk. Essentially, what is done is as soon as the data arrives, it's allowed to override an ongoing transmission. So essentially, the goal is to cut down on the scheduling delay. So not only do things happen eight times faster, as soon as traffic arrives, ultra reliable low latency traffic arrives, you override the ongoing transmission and you let it go. Right. So these are essentially how you would pull these things off, be it ultra or be it for hyper. Right. So now let me just focus a little bit more on multi-connectivity because that's essentially the focus of this talk. The idea is really very simple. Multi-connectivity has been there since several releases, but I suspect it's going to take a bigger and bigger role as we go further uh, with the reliability requirements. So essentially the idea is very simple. Like I said, you have multiple base stations. And if you look at downlink multi-connectivity, essentially multiple base stations transmit the same packet to the user and the user can combine the signals it gets from the base stations or select the best one or do various other things. And it's easy to see that, you know, the reliability significantly improves because now all four links essentially have to be messed up for your transmission to fail. Now, the architecture I'm talking about is called packet duplication in the sense that the same packet is sent from multiple base stations. But there are other paradigms also that people look at. For example, they talk about packet splitting. So you send different parts of the packet from different G node Bs. Or there's also something called load balancing where you can even, you know, uh, accommodate different loads on different base stations depending on how busy they are or how packed they are. So there are different architectures of multi-connectivity, but let's just focus on the simplest one of them all, which is packet duplication. So what I'm going to talk about today is what happens when you try to achieve these targets of URLLC or HRLLC using techniques like multi-connectivity and preemption? Um, and essentially two things happen. We'll see that it does not come for free, these very difficult uh, requirements. You have to, to achieve the very high reliability requirements, you need to compromise somewhere. For example, you will essentially be compromising on the rates you would be offering to the other users. For example, to the EMBB users or MMTC users. Essentially, the way you want to think of a URLLC user is it's a VIP. When the VIP is on the road, you pretty much shut all other traffic down. That's one way of thinking about how um, URLLC works. So what we want to understand is, well, you, of course, don't want to shut all the traffic down. Um, you want to come up with better things to do, so better resource allocation algorithms that can, in a way, balance this need for high reliability, low latency with uh, the needs of the other uh, types of users, such as EMBB and MMTC users. Um, and we look at the problems that arise there. Several very nice new problems arise when you study these algorithms. So what I'll do is very quickly in the next few minutes, um, do four things. One is go quickly a little bit more into preemption and multi-connectivity so that we understand the trade-offs. Then I'll pose the coexistence problem. No equations, I promise. Um, and then uh, I'll just show you two sample results about how effective uh, cellular deployment can be in achieving the targets that URLC has. And also, what sort of uh, implications does it have for ongoing traffic? And then I'll summarize. So let me just focus a little bit more on preemption uh, and motivate it a little better. Um, so the idea is very, very simple. Uh, so like I said, as soon as the URL LC packet comes, it's transmitted. You just don't wait for the ongoing transmission to end. For example, you don't wait for the slot boundary. You just go boom, fire it away as soon as you can. Now, why do, would you want to do that? The idea is very simple. It cuts down on your scheduling delays. And uh, what happens is that your other, it also rules out another option, uh, a resource expensive option, which is, well, if you didn't want to override an ongoing data transmission, the only other option you would essentially have is to leave some resources aside for URLC traffic, you know, have a separate bus lane, for example, that's what you do for a VIP traffic. So, uh, but then that's, a, that's waste resources and URLC traffic, you don't expect them lots of packets all the time. You expect a few packets, but very critical packets. Um, so preemption basically lets you cut down on the scheduling delays uh, by using existing resources. And of course, if you preempt traffic, for example, in this figure, you can see that the URLC packet is essentially occupying two OFDM symbols um, in time and two physical resource blocks or PRBs in the frequency domain. So it's essentially hurting two EMBB PRBs. So you do tell the EMBB users, hey, I, the base station will tell inform the EMBB users, hey, I've used these 
OFDM symbol. So please don't try to decode this. Just treat them as erasures. Assume nothing was transmitted in them and then go ahead and decode. Uh, otherwise, you'll just get very confused. But this is preemption. It's a very natural idea. And what are the implications of preemption? Well, it's not hard to see that preemption hurts an EMBB user because essentially you're taking away some of the data symbols that you had allocated to the EMBB user. So if you take away a few data symbols, essentially you think of a channel code, you're taking away some, erasing some, you know, some bits in the code word, your block error rate or a packet error rate increases, BLDR increases. And if your block error rate increases, essentially your throughput will come down because throughput is proportional to one minus block error rate. Now, the important thing to notice here is that how much the loss in throughput is depends on how many EMBB PRBs are preempted. Uh, if you preempt or puncture more EMBB PRBs, well, you'll have a higher EMBB throughput. And the reason why I say this is the footprint, that the size of that red rectangle depends on what uh, modulation and coding scheme you use for the URLs user. If you use a very conservative modulation and coding scheme, BPSK, very low rate, it will give you fantastic reliability, but it's going to guzzle up a lot of PRBs. Um, but if you're very aggressive with the URL, let's see, MCS, you use, you know, 64 QAM, almost no coding, then you'll have far fewer EMBB PRBs that are punctured, but then your URL reliability goes down. That's essentially the trade-off. And in this table here, um, this is done, simulations done by my master's student, uh, Govindu. Uh, what is shown here is different MCSs that are spec for URLC. And on the rightmost column, the throughput loss in megabits per second of an EMBB user. And you can see that the throughput loss can vary significantly all the way from essentially 0.1 megabits per second to 3 megabits per second, depending on which modulation and coding scheme you use for the URLC user. So this clearly shows that you need to be very careful when you make these uh, you know, decisions. This motivates the resource allocation algorithm. All right. So there are two paradigms before I get more into you know, the resource allocation problem, because I'll be using these two acronyms, and these do arise quite a bit. If you look at the uh, multi-connectivity literature, there are two paradigms, broadly speaking. One is what's called joint transmission. The idea is that all the G node Bs, for example, here in this figure, you'll see four G node Bs trying to serve a single URL user. Um, they would all transmit on the same time frequency resources. And essentially what happens is the signals add up at the URLC user, and you can show that the signal to noise ratio, the net signal to noise ratio is actually the sum of the individual link signal to noise ratio. So you get SNR boost, and the SNR boost translates into, for example, better reliability. Now there's another paradigm called orthogonal transmission where these G node Bs transmit on orthogonal resources. Uh, so essentially transmit over orthogonal time frequency resources. And there are some advantages to it they, because they are now orthogonal. They, each one can use its own MCS depending on you know, what its link state is, link quality is. And it turns out this also requires less channel quality feedback to pull off. Uh, but these are the two things. But regardless, the two things, that, the one thing that happens regardless of whether you use JT or OT is that you are puncturing, taking away resources of multiple EMBB users and that reduces the EMBB throughput. So essentially the problem uh, of URLLC EMBB coexistence or HRLLC EMBB coexistence is the following. How do you choose the modulation and coding scheme that you, for, the, for a URLC user that's going to preempt the EMBB users? And how do you choose which base stations are going to cooperate? You know, if more base stations cooperate, then, well, you have a better SNR, but then you're stealing resources from many more EMBB users. So how do you choose the base stations and their modulation and coding schemes? to meet the tight URL LC reliability constraint while minimizing the damage it causes to the EMBB users. So minimize the EMBB throughput loss. So let's look at the trade-offs, the very natural trade-offs. So if more G, G node Bs cooperate, well, you get a better SNR for URL LC. That means I can essentially pump data out using a higher rate modulation and coding scheme while still meeting the tight constraint. If I can pump at a higher data rate, I need fewer PRBs to transmit my payload. So think of a payload as 32 bytes. Um, but the catch is because there are more G node Bs that are cooperating, each of them is serving one or two EMBB users. For example, you're preempting more EMBB users. That's the bad part. Now, if you flip it, you say, well, what happens if fewer G node Bs cooperate? Well, you have lesser SNR. So you have to basically back off on your modulation coding scheme. You have to become more conservative to meet the tight URL LC constraints. And you're going to guzzle more PRBs because your, your payload now will occupy more PRBs. But the advantage is, well, fewer EMBB users are preempted because there are fewer G node Bs that are cooperating. 
So essentially, this is the fundamental system design trade-off that you have to deal with. Now you can pose an optimization problem, cast it mathematically, and solve it. I'm going to skip the details, um, uh, but let me just show you results. At least qualitatively, let's try to understand the results. The hard numbers won't make sense to you unless I tell you the clear simulation setup, which I'm not going to do. But broadly, what we did was we took four G node Bs, threw them in a 300 by 300 deployment area. So think of it like you know a private network type thingy, um, and they're trying to serve a URLC user. And what I'm showing you here is what we called achievability as a function of the URLC error target. So look at the error targets, the, the x-axis, it's the, the it ranges from 10 power minus 8, really, really tight error targets, to 10 power minus 4, which is still also quite tight. And the achievability, uh, the way you want to think about it is, is the probability that you can meet the error rate requirements of the URLC user. Who meets the error rate requirements? Multi-connectivity. So the probability that the user's block error rate requirement is met by multi-connectivity. That's achievability. So the higher, the better. Um, and that's really what you want to strive for. And what you see, for example, if you look at um, what are shown is, you know, results for two different transmit paths. So you see several interesting things. One is if, as you relax your error target, you know, you go from 10 power minus 8 to 10 power minus 4. Obviously, things become easier for the system. Achievability improves. As you jack up your transmit power, uh, achievability improves. But perhaps the most important takeaway from this figure is that um, joint transmission actually has a better achievability than orthogonal transmission. I'm not going to why, but uh, that's what it turns out to be. Now, this is the part about URLC. How, how capable is a deployment of supporting URLC traffic? This is the other flip side, which is how much does a URLC deployment hurt EMBB users? So EMBB throughput loss. So I'm again showing throughput loss in kilobits per second per PRB as a function of the error target. It basically ranges from 10 power minus 4 to 10 power minus 8. Again, similar trends. You will see that as the error rate requirement is relaxed, the throughput loss comes down. Um, and MCMSA, I'm not explaining the acronyms here. MCMSA turns out to be the optimal algorithm. We proved it. And the other FSS is something, is essentially a non-adaptive algorithm. And it turns out that it incurs a much larger throughput loss. So adapting who cooperates and what the rates are does make a big difference. You can have fairly significant differences in throughput losses. Um, and again, the interesting point we learned was that joint transmission does far better than orthogonal transmission. It has a lower throughput loss. Okay. So uh, I have, I think, three more minutes. So uh, let me wrap up. Before I do that, I will say two things. When you study a problem like this in the context of a 5G standard or a 6G standard, um, you run into some very new interesting um, system design issues. And I'm going to talk about two of them. I'll call them twists. So the first twist is that all the decisions that you make, who should cooperate, what rate should they transmit with, depends on the channel quality feedback that the base stations get, the G node Bs get. CQI, it's called channel quality indicator. And inevitably, in these systems, the CQI feedback and the time at which the transmission happens, they're separated in time by a couple of milliseconds. Depends on you know, how fast your feedback loops are. Um, they obviously have to be faster to support URLC, but there's inevitably a delay. And what a delay does is it basically makes the channel state information or the CQI information that you have partially outdated. If it's totally outdated, then you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Partially outdated. And even partially outdated is difficult because your target error rates are so low. You really um, are essentially pushed to a corner and you're fighting back. So what happens with when you have delayed CQI feedback, partially delayed? First, uh, essentially, because your estimates are partially outdated, your decisions about who should cooperate, what the modulation coding scheme should be, if you're using MIMO or the precoder should be, all of them become suboptimal because, well, you don't know what the channel is. And in fact, on a more fundamental level, typically in URLC, you know, till now I've been saying block error rate requirements. Now it turns out I don't even know what my SNR is when I'm going to transmit because it's my information is partially outdated. So I can't even tell you what my block error rate is going to be. Block error rate itself becomes a random variable. So you have to revisit the way you, you know, define or specify URLC traffic. Okay, that's the first twist. Now, this is the second and the last twist. So as I said, you know, depending on what the modulation coding scheme is, the URLC payload can take up multiple PRBs, one, two, three, four, multiple PRBs. And in a frequency selective channel, which is essentially something that arises because you have lots of multipaths, uh, uh, the channel is not flat. It varies over different PRBs or subcarriers. And but the 5G standard requires that when you transmit a packet, 
a code, a transport block as they call it to a user, you must use the same modulation and coding scheme across all the PRBs, regardless of what their state is. So you're transmitting over PRBs, some of which have bad channels, some of which have good channels, but you must stick to the same modulation and coding scheme. So the question that arises is, hey, how do I figure out which modulation and coding scheme to use? So that's the second twist. I'm not going to answer them. I'm going to just throw these twists at you. But let me summarize and conclude. Uh, so uh, essentially what this talk was about was the hyper reliability and the low latency requirements that 5G started off with and 6G is finessing even more. Um, and these are very challenging requirements. So you do need uh, you know, a combination of techniques to meet these requirements. And the techniques I focused on in this talk uh, were multi-connectivity and preemption, very natural things to do, um, and but one has to design them correctly. So yes, they do give you what you want, but you have to be careful of their impact on other users. And the way you deal with the impact is by adapting to the channel state uh, information you get. Um, the bottom line is, and this is what why we do these things, is there's several very interesting new research problems because these targets are so very difficult to meet. Um, so if you're more interested, here is a reference that you can look at. Uh, this is a transactions and wireless paper that appeared a few months back. It's fairly recent and it has all the modeling details and the mathematical analysis and all that that goes into this problem. And all the results I showed you are from this paper. So I'll close with this slide. This is a slide that tells you who we are. Um, essentially, my group in, in uh, IAC, we work on essentially next generation wireless systems. We focus on design, modeling and analysis of these systems. Uh, it's a very active group. Uh, there's a QR code. Uh, you can essentially uh, go to the website and there are many videos also we have, much more you know, technical videos uh, about essentially the modeling and analysis that we do. And a um, lot of companies have helped us in our efforts so, and government agencies too. So thanks to all of them. So with that, I'll stop. Uh, I can take questions. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Professor Nilesh. That was a very in insightful presentation. I have learned a lot about URLLC and HRLLC and the way you explain things. It was very uh, easy to understand. Thank you so much. Uh, let me quickly go over a couple of questions we may have here. Um, so can a joint transmission be treated as multi-TRP? That is one of the questions. I don't know the answer because this multi-TRP terminology, I still haven't got a full handle on it. So I don't know the answer, honestly. Maybe Ashok or somebody who is in this audience can answer it. I don't know. Yeah, it, it is considered as multi-TRP thing. We should treat it as right, multi-TRP. Yeah. Thank you. And another question is, what is meant by many G node Bs cooperate? Oh, so in multi-connectivity, what you have is multiple base stations or G node Bs would transmit essentially the same data to the user. That's why it's called multi-connectivity. So when I say they transmit together, I mean they're cooperating. Yeah, yeah that, that's what I got from your presentation as well. But thank you. I had another question, uh, one small question. So practically speaking, how easy or what do you foresee as the challenges in the practical implementation of HRLLC related aspects and, and all the challenges that you spoke about uh, and the research work that your team has been doing related to simulation and what are the challenges you faced along the way. Uh, can you briefly mention a couple of points? So I don't have a complete answer. We're still getting our feet wet in this area. Um, but I'll say a few things. First, in, I think there are two, two aspects to it. One is meeting the very low error rate requirements. And so there you can essentially throw a bunch of techniques at it, you know, mix them up and get the error rate requirements. Of course, there is a resource utilization. Your resource utilization goes up. You, so you live with it. But I think practically from an implementation point of view, again, I could, I can be corrected. Ne I never build these systems. You know, I never take circuits and do this. To me, is actually the low latency part. A, a, a sub milli 0 0.1 millisecond latency. This is not a physical layer, end-to-end -end physical layer. These are, they're talking about essentially latencies across multiple layers of the protocol stack. So you, not only do you have to speed up your physical layer, you know, you've got to get your timelines down to one eighth of a millisecond, but even the processing, the scheduling, uh, what happens at the RRC layer, all of that is now you're under an extremely tight uh, time budget. And how to pull this off, I think that's really where the main practical challenge is, at least to me. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Yeah, uh, it's going to be pretty huge challenge, I'm sure, to achieve when we'll get there in 2030 or 
wherever uh, whenever we will get there but yeah thank you so much for summarizing the uh, topic really well and uh, to help us understand the challenges and the you know implications and things like that about how it can be implemented and um, in the you know in the labs as well as in the real world thank you so much for your inf insightful presentation sir yeah, thanks um, so moving on to our next speaker um, he is Mr. Ashok Kumar Reddy from Samsung Research India. He is going to be presenting on integrated AI and communication, a new 6G frontier. Uh, Mr. Ashok Kumar uh, Reddy Chawa is a current is currently a director of engineering at Samsung Research. He received his ME degree in telecommunication engineering from the IASC Bangalore in 2005. Uh, over to you, Mr. Ashok. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening, uh, everyone. Thanks to TSDSI for this invitation for the TTDD. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, AI and communication. That's integration part of it. And also uh, that being a new frontier, should be considered as a new frontier, or is it an utility that we should use? That will be my main focus today in this talk. So before we get into the talk, I think we should definitely uh, see this picture, the usage scenario of IMT 2030. This is where we see AI and communication. So if you see this corner of this hexagon and compare with every other side of this hexagon and of use cases, use scenarios, this is one case where we don't see direct use case to users or applications directly. This is something that should be treated at, as a uh, as a utility or something that can help the networks become more and more efficient is what I see as a, as a, as a, as a direct uh, implication from here. Because if you compare any other point here, let's say ubiquity or massive communication, they are linked to a particular use case or usage scenario. But this one has a specific connotation of utility uh, as an example. So from here today, there are two ways to look at AI and communication. AI for communication and communication for AI. These two are both come with an and uh, connotation there. So I'm going to consider and going to talk only about AI for communication. Mainly, I'm going to also focus a little bit more on the lower layers where uh, we try to apply this for a few use cases. And I'm going to talk about the standardization difficulties and how what are the implications there for towards 6G. So this is a small picture from uh, Samsung 6G white paper, which came a few years back. It's reasonably old. This will be try to show how uh, AI uh, is to be applied locally in, in each of these modules. Let's say UE base station, or let's say core network or application server, or for an application inside that, or a specific use inside that, are joined when there are two entities involved in that are kind of communicating with one machine to other machine, the kind of these machines are separated into two parts. That is another way of using the uh, AI. And third one is where you actually have this spread across all the layers, all, all from UE to the application server, from application server to the UE as well in, in return. This comprehensive AI kind of, kind of segregates and uh, classifies into uh, usage of AI for communication into different layers to start with okay so today i will mainly cover about the cases which actually have some local ai use cases some giant ui before we go further into the, uh, the research that we have done our team has done here i would like to quickly summarize what is happening in cgpp and this give a glimpse of how it would actually transform and move towards as we move towards 5g uh, 6g what will this turn out to be Okay. So for us to see the future, we need to understand what's there, where are we right now. I'll just quickly summarize what's happening here. So TGPP had released 18 study items, studied AI and ML as a usage uh, for art, uh, air interface uh, applications. Here, 
there were three groups mainly involved ran 1 ran 2 and ran 4 each of them trying to look at what are the main important aspects of uh, how to use ai for ai interface ran 1 may specifically uh, tried to consider the physical layer aspects and it tries tried to pick up few use cases which are dominantly uh, studied by various other researchers and see if, how to really deploy them in a system which is practical that's that's the main objective of the uh, five aspect and use case value, use case um, considered as well so here also along with that the framework how do we exchange information between these two entities if there are how do we exchange a model between uh, a transmitter and receiver or a base station and uv these things are also kind of uh, considered discussed uh, uh, exhaustively okay so in that in that sense i think i'm going to once again talk a little bit more in the ran ones specific specific ness today and also cover more of a physical layer uh, examples today uh, for the benefit of uh, the uh, audience here and of course there are uh, signaling for life cycle management and performance tests were also covered by ran 2 and ran 4 specifically so let me move on here uh, so the main three use cases considered in release 18 study item which actually kind of some of them are continuing right now as well extend with the extended deadline are a csi channel state information one is to see how to predict the channel state information from the from the past csi that you have to the future csi that you would actually want to report this kind of covers the aging of the CSI problem, effectively the kind of thing Professor Nilesh just covered about the age actually has a lot of significance in CSI. When you want to use, a scheduler wants to this, use this information, there, there is age that is going to play a significant role in the effective capacity of the network. So how to use the prediction? Uh, it's a more of a UE side problem. I, I'll show you some results uh, of what we have done here in previous times, also some of them already in the product. Uh, as of now okay so and also csi compression was another example which is to try to see how much information you want to feed back to the base station how do we reduce that amount uh, is the one of the main thing while we reduce also want to maintain the accuracy of report as much as possible that's actually the main intention there it was studied this is the only model which needed a, a split of the model at the transmitter and receiver there was supposed to there, we need to have one encoder and decoder encoder decoder need to be split and stay at both base station UV, uh, UV separately. That was the main, only one use case which actually needed these two-sided models. Whereas if you see all the other cases, like I'm going to cover the beam management, also there are two specific main targets uh, tried here. The spatial domain beam prediction, actually if you have some uh, sparse measurements with you, how would you uh, predict the more fine-tuned, fine, fine -tuned, uh, high resolution uh, measurements from it? That's from the spatial domain prediction. And the other one is the spatial temporal domain beam prediction. It's both spatial and temporal. How do we predict? That's another advanced use case of this one. It actually looks at the time variations as well in, uh, in, in a more sophisticated way. Okay. So these are the main uh, two use cases in the beam management. Positioning, of course, is more about if you have channel, uh, channel impulse response with you, the channel estimate with you, how can you better the positioning information that is there at the UE when you report to the base station? Or how can you help base station do something better? It's, uh, the main thing that are uh, handled here so this is the setup that uh, these are example use cases that they, they don't mean that these will be the only use cases they, these were shortlisted based on a lot of uh, consensus in the uh, ran but um, and i'll show you some some things that we have done in the same space before ran started on these work items uh, in the next slides so tentatively the gpp is going to look at how the ai can be used for air interface and few other dimensions that i'm highlighting here uh, radio resource management, maybe communication sensing as another use case, channel estimation, and also non-linearity correction, especially from the power amplifier viewpoint, uh, um, and also DRX management, uh, discontinuous reception is a management connected mode and uh, uh, idle mode kind of use cases. Mobility management, mainly between uh, going between one from one base station to other base station. How do we hand over? When do we hand over? How do we manage things better? And also MIMO receiver, this is more like a RAN4 receiver optimization kind of a use case. But there are cases where I'm going to cover that these specific use, uh, points there where we can reduce the complexity and make things better are some of these use cases that are being considered in uh, this 19, the 10 to 2 list right now. So with that, 
so let me further uh, highlight the observations uh, from this study that has gone from almost one and a half year right now uh, at the tgpp is spending maybe hundreds of researchers across the world what is the main thing that i found from all these um, summaries is that this is the first time ai or ml being studied for air interface or maybe you want to use somehow this ai and ml for air interfaces first time that's considered the many thing, new things came up in this discussions actually kind of how do we transfer this model there is no till now if you compare a traditional specification if you go and read either uh, lte or maybe 5g nr specifications there is no specific mention of a model transfer between base, base station to ue or ue to base station and the states are very very human understandable states that you understand when you read it again you can debug this hey this means this particular cqi uh, this particular uh, state means uh, this in my context in program context or uh, signal processing context so but whereas in this setup if you see unless you have this model there is no easy way to understand what is being transmitted between these two and what also about which ue and genode b settings to be tweaked and there are should we go with two sided model if you go with two sided model there is a kind of uh, uh, some intellectual property uh, leakage kind of a problems there what is the framework for exchanging should we do online or offline methods and how do we uh, collaborate so multiple who who trains what kind of machine how do we collaborate how do we co uh, co train uh, some of these models these are some questions which are very very evidently available to see there which were never the case in uh, the traditional uh, conventional way of doing communication so there is with ai there are trends are changing the way specification or standardization need to happen will certainly change that's one of the important thing that we should remember for today along with that training and data who is going to own this who is who, or all all of us will have access to the data i will it be specific to only people who have the devices or base stations with them all these aspects are important things to consider and uh, as we evolve into towards 6g these things will get clearer and clearer of course things will be more democratized as we go along that can actually be one of the things that one can consider how do we make this kind of a data accessible to more and more researchers let's in academia or in anywhere else maybe governments can also think about how do we make this kind of setups uh, accessible to more uh, in on a more open setup so the data is available so people can come up with their own methods and improve and make it more closer to other ecosystems that are already there like maybe uh, let's say image or video uh, or maybe large language model kind of a setup there is ecosystem that's built i think that kind of setup is also required here to make things um, travel towards 6g if you if you like ai to help 6g we need to make these things possible is what i see right now so with that i would like to show uh, my view and the way actually i drew this picture uh, four years back when i was just looking at uh, what where can ai help yes, this is one of the picture i still didn't change any of any bit of from there so i will just quickly show you where, where all we can uh, see the standards coming in where all we can actually do no need of uh, standard but it's more of implementation specific i'll quickly show the use this picture to explain this uh, for the uh, sake of audience Uh, so conventional communication system task starts from let's say assuming that it starts transport protocols resource scheduling mappers uh, baseband and transmit uh, impairment mitigation rf and, and antennas goes through channel and comes to the receiver here like there are receiver impairments measurement and report and housekeeping baseband processing channel estimation there are a lot of modules that all of us uh, many of us are aware of and this is how the present system both 4g 5g systems work there is it's abstracted out to actually cover most of the conventional systems right now there is some feedback here which actually is understandable we know how what is being sent what it means when we actually look at the data and what it means in sense of for the user throughput all of this can be interpreted very quickly by humans so in the ai based systems i see uh, these are the some uh i wanted to keep it uh, the functionality in the same place assuming that we need some similar functionality even if it is a influenced or a driven system which still have the uh, the aspects of transport protocol functionality mapped to a new system so it should still be there so I, those things will exactly stay there that's how i have shown here so how would they get influenced i have written in blue here wherever they can get influenced where the state exchange between required to between two uh, entities if you look at uh, there so 
a based uh, congestion and rate control can actually be one thing a transport layer right now there are very very fundamental tcp congestion protocols are there they are being evolved but there is much more one can hopefully look at there uh, a based resource uh, scheduling and prioritization uses the state feedback from the user which was typically user, human understandable right now now it actually can be uh, state compressed and state exchange between these two machines only these two networks or models that are there at the transmitter and receiver can understand it and of course they can interpret better than humans hopefully for the better maybe improved efficiency spectral efficiency as well but these things would impact like this is what we are seeing right now the compression item the work item that i have shown you it's very close related to this when when you send a report it doesn't need to be understood over the air it's more like in some one way it's more secure you can't see what's going what's going on the air unless you have that model with you as well to see so if you look at uh, some of these uh, things at the baseband uh, transmit scheme selection effectively what is the right thing to do it actually can be standardized as well there are some things which need not be the impairment mitigation stuff can actually be still uh, completely be handled without any specification impact um, and of course the receive side as well uh, the rf mitigation there are a lot of uh, a lot of research happening in that space as well the influence uh, in the uh, the baseband of course there are a lot of modules which actually i'll show a few of the examples just quickly to glance and show you this is that it is feasible to do some things in this space um, there are few things that we can uh, change at the receiver and also the transmitter comfortably um, and make the uh, system more and more efficient that's those are places where we can use ai without getting the it's like what is the return on investment kind of a questions okay let me at at a high level this is what i see when uh, there will be information exchange across the layers making it more and more look like a single entity than where we actually have seen this partition between these layers and one layer doesn't understand other layer and don't understand what's the state at which it is in right now uh, that would actually move forward maybe towards 6g systems will actually be more and more integrated from the layer view point they'll actually have some kind of information exchange between these so that they can take some decisions in a more informed way than what are, what's happening right now okay so, so i would like to quickly show some results uh, here uh, first is channel estimation example this is uh, more like a signal processing example here we wanted to check from the literature uh, what was happening there people were trying to use one of the complex image processing algorithms and try to see if we can apply for channel estimation but we actually fell back to a little bit on the model driven uh, kind of an approach here because uh, our internal feeling right now still is that a model driven approach even though we want to apply ai still is more powerful in many sense because it actually doesn't need too much of uh, training requirements it does know what kind of flow in the signal is and it understands the signal a little bit better of course you want to replace some of these modules with ai we tried a model driven approach and actually found that uh, it is in sig significantly better in cases where uh, let's say in compared with mmsc uh, ideal mmsc or mmsc use cases where MMSC doesn't have access to the best possible statistics of the channel. And this guy, when, lead, when, when a machine is trained for various kind of possible channels and use it in any of these channels, it does better. Whereas MMSC needs that specific channel statistic for it to work. There are some examples like that. And we have also shown when we use model driven approaches, we actually can reduce the complexity significantly compared to any other non model driven approaches. That's also another finding that uh, we have come, up, come to learn. So beam management is another uh, application we tried, actually. This is uh, something that uh, we tried uh, using uh, along with the sensor data. If you have measurements, how do we predict uh, a beam which would actually be appropriate for you in future? The beam selection problem specifically at the user. Uh, it, we have shown up to 40% gains uh, compared to just using a sensor data and measurement data. And compared to conventional uh, millimeter wave systems, how, would it, how can it take advantage of the uh, measurements and the past measurements and also the sensor data. We try to show this uh, and also it's published uh, recently. Uh, the smart CSI is something which actually is more related to channel state information about the channel aging problem and how do we solve it. Actually, this is there is no simple solution. There's always a prediction that we would like to do, but prediction is only accurate to an, a good, good extent, uh, but not really perfect all the time. So here is an example we try to see. We try to predict a CSI into the future. Going from here, we have only past measurements. We'd like to see what how the future would look like uh, from the past measurements. 
and because the base station is going to take a decision in the future at this moment uh, not here okay because but we have the uh, channel state preference only till here accessible at the base station so that's the problem we tried to solve what if we could predict using for past measurements to the future this is what we tried this is actually uh, one of our first works and we published in 2021 uh, and also part of this work is already uh, there in some of our devices we tried this and actually gives uh, reasonably good gains in real 5g devices um, it's uh, already practical i wanted to show you some examples which are really practical here so wherever it is feasible uh, this is one example. It's not directly linked to any of the uh, products or any of the algorithms, but this is something which actually um, interests anyone who is in the wireless field. When you talk about channel model, you actually know all these equations. You need to really statistically model all this stuff. Um, the channels that vary in time and frequency, how do we model? It's, it's a set models defined by TGPP and various other bodies as well. So we tried to take one of the channels and see if we can really replicate the channels using one of the latest technologies that was their uh, methods that was there during that time and we are extending further now as a GAN based method we, have, we showed that we can actually model a nice wireless channel without actually using any of this math behind it by really training it on this channel being able to replicate it hundreds and thousands of new realizations using the GAN based approach is a generative to adversarial network which helped us create new new channels from past learnings at, about this channels. it's very very close to what you may have seen generate a cat image which has a uh, sword in, in hands that kind of a thing where you can actually generate new cats as you go along every time you prompt it it'll generate a new cat so that's something like that every time you prompt it it'll give a new channel so so similarly, with the, in the interest of time, I'll quickly run through a few more applications. So the smart decoder is somewhere where we, no, don't replace any of the decoder. These are well optimized. Let's say Turbo or Polar or any of the uh, LDPC decoders. They're well, uh, nicely um, packed and they're good in shape already. So we try to see uh, when to stop this decoder. That's just a brain added brain over the existing uh, decoders. So when to stop this. Uh, add that layer of intelligence over the existing system. That's what we tried. We showed still 30 to 40% gains in power uh, for this case. Similarly, uh, DPD, as a power amplifier is one of the biggest problem cases. If it has been 3G, 4G, 5G, and continues to be a problem for 6G as well. As we go along, it's never going to go away because there are some fundamental problems in the way we make these devices. So we try to solve the problem by you going to DPD. We're trying to see if we can replace the conventional DPD algorithm, which is more based on specific powers of nonlinear um, uh, input sequence. So we try to solve this problem using AI, but we, we were able to get good gains in there as well. This is one of our first works actually in 2017. First time we tried to apply. This was the problem we tried. Here is where we tried to predict the handover in advance. Okay, This actually gave very good uh, results there. We were able to predict the handover failure quite in advance. This is the use case now, one of the use cases that hopefully uh, RAND2 will study uh, in release 19. As of course, um, another thing, whenever you see a system, you know, talk about a pilot pattern, what is the 4G pilot pattern, 5G pilot pattern, what if you make it more generic? What if you learn from the channel as we go along? This is a kind of thing that we try, this pilot pattern by learning from the channel itself what is the right thing for that channel instance as it travel as it as you move along the channel will change but for that we may have to find new one maybe the best for that okay that's that's what's the main crux of this idea as well the intention of me showing here without going deep here is to actually uh, some sometimes motivate you to see there are use cases uh, we should keep looking out for uh, maybe replacing end to end system may not be so easy right now but, uh, but as it evolves, I think as these blocks come in and they actually start talking with each other, we, there, it may be feasible. But as of now, uh, replacing continuous uh, transmit and receive chain completely with AI uh, may be possible in lab uh, or maybe in a system or a simulation system, but it is a little bit uh, for future. Okay. So, but uh, right now, the, there are things that I see are the things which are either transmitter or receiver blocks, which need some intelligence, which need some kind of a, uh, ease in implementation. That's where uh, we see some examples. Okay, So I would like to uh, skip this work item here. Okay, so we tried some work on integrated sensing and communication. But it's a quick example I'd like to show. This was a challenge uh, by ITU uh, through NIST. NIST posed a challenge and saying, if I'll give you channel impulse response uh, of a given system, uh, and uh, can you really measure the depth map of it. So we tried and we actually were winners of this uh, challenge. So I will skip this. Towards 6G, I only want a couple of things I would like to mention. There are 
many many things that one can do uh, but we need to try and find out it's not unlike a conventional uh, theory plays a role model driven methods are much better than completely blindly going and put a big machine to learn everything that you like and the competition capability so see you should be able to see what's going to be the competition capability of the future systems and see back backwards say hey, maybe this is feasible for future because each of these methods need one or two years of lead time for developing them making them feasible to really uh, adapt to practical systems so the competition capability uh, forcing is very important here and of course uh, explainability debuggability are the main problems here with that i would like to once again end with my in my talk with uh, this stamp of uh, uh, imt 2030 which is going to be uh, like more and more visible as we go along till we see 2030 okay that thank you any questions are uh, we can go to next uh, thank you so much mr ashok that was a very insightful presentation we learned a lot about how ai ml models are Uh, actually deployed and you know uh, through your research work as well we learned a lot uh, thank you so much uh, i'll just take one or two one question maybe in the interest of time uh, any emphasis on transformers or attention based architectures in wireless over existing ml models sorry sir you are on mute sorry actually i have heard of attention uh, based networks in recent times uh, of course there are various applications i wouldn't really say uh, either this or that would be good but i think best way is to try it and find out i wouldn't say this is this not there are many cases where we have shown much more complex methods versus a simple model driven method actually bet the complex method very very uh, easily because it understand the system so it's very good easy way is to go and try it uh, ourselves whatever new method that comes up in literature just why don't we apply it for communication is the right way to see uh, then will it work or not is I, i don't think i can answer directly right okay thanks a lot thanks a lot so much for your time uh, we will move on to the next speaker now thank you um so we have professor arpan chattopadhyay who will be talking about sensing related communication uh, for 6g um he is uh, professor arpan chattopadhyay has received the bachelor's in degree uh, engineering degree in electronics and telecommunication from uh, jadavpur university kolkata in 2008 and the me and phd degrees in telecommunication from the indian uh, institute of science bengaluru in 2010 and 2015 respectively uh over to you uh, professor arpan uh, for the talk yeah. am i audible yes so uh, yeah okay so let me share my screen yeah uh, uh just give me a minute uh, i think i should yeah uh can you see the slides yes we can okay uh, so uh, thanks for inviting me here uh, so um, i will give a very high level talk on uh, some possible research directions for dfrc systems uh, dfrc stands for dual function radar communication systems so uh, we have recently started working in this area and i find this area to be very exciting and many challenging problems are there um, so i don't work on standardization as such so don't expect that flavor from me uh, i will mostly focus on research problems Uh, where serious academic uh, you know uh, thoughts need to be involved okay uh, so the motivation for integrated sensing and communication uh, i mean i think it's almost uh, clear to all of you uh, but um, just for completion uh, for the sake of completeness i will just briefly mention it so uh, so you know that communication traffic uh, is increasing day by day all over the world and this requires uh, this actually motivated the researchers and telecom operators to search for extra spectrum uh, and in the process what happened is that communication um, telecom operators and researchers they have started exploring that traditional um, uh, the, the, the spectrum resources that are traditionally allocated to radars and now you can see that uh, communication and radar operations are happening simultaneously in many frequency bands for example in below 10 gigahertz you can see that lte wifi and um, is uh, is is actually uh, lte and wifi are using 1 to 10 gigahertz frequency band 
at the same time you are using AT atc or shipboard radars in the same frequency band similarly millimeter wave you can have 5g nr and automotive radars so uh, and all of you are i think aware of that radars can be either pulsed radars or they can be continuous wave radars i'm just uh, basically giving a giving an giving an idea of how heterogeneous the system could be so there are various types of radars pulsed radars continuous wave radar in communication you can have data packets you can have preambles in the packets so basically the system is very heterogeneous and very complex and we have we want to explore the desired possibilities in this in in this domain so what are the challenges with existing pro, uh, systems let us uh, discuss that so if you have too many devices competing for the same spectrum then there will be issues of interference you have to ha manage interference the interference could come for, from other devices and it could come from the same device as well specifically if it is a full duplex device uh, there are synchronization issues um, you need to exchange channel channel information among nodes there will be coordination signals that need to be sent from one node to another so it becomes a big challenge now when the same platform uses radar and communication into different basically they, they use different hard separate hardware for radar and communication then the weight and volume of the platform increases um, because your radar requires large cross section and communication requires large number of antennas and rf chains it, it also increases energy consumption uh, and there will be electromagnetic compatibility issues for example the, if, if the same vehicle has two different units for radar and communication uh, they can interfere with each other so the question is can radar and communication uh, transmissions be, be com combined uh, can they use the same hardware and they can can they occur at the same frequency band and can they help each other so the idea of joint communication of and radar is not new actually uh, radar and communication transmissions uh, existed coexisted earlier also uh, what happened recently is that people started using the same hardware basically the idea of DFRC or dual function radar communication systems, basic idea is that they will use the same hardware and same trans specifically same transceiver. Now, uh, the design of joint communication and radar systems um, can have three possible approaches. Uh, one is communication centric JCR, the other one is radar centric JCR, and the third one is basically jointly uh, optimized dual function radar communication systems, which I will talk in the next slide. So communication centric JCR is the following. Basically here, uh, communication uh, actually has the primary importance and radar operation is secondary. So radar sensing is integrated into existing communication systems. Uh, and in this process, the primary communication signals and protocols remain almost the same. For example, in I IEEE 802.11 ATD FRC system, um, it offers single carrier option. Uh, also, it offers wave DM it, as an option. Uh, so if you use WebDM, then probably you can't have much flexibility on uh, designing your radar signals. Uh, then you, we, we can also think of mobile network DFRC systems where uh, downlink and uplink, uplink signals can be used for sensing as well. On the other hand, we have radar-centric uh, joint communication radar systems or radar-centric design as such. So here what happens is uh, you can embed information in the radar signals. So there are many possible approaches. Two major ones are basically either modify the waveform or you mod do some kind of index modulation. So if you modify the waveform, then basically you can do it in time frequency embedding. Say for example, uh, you, can, uh, you can actually change the, modulate the amplitude, phrase or frequency of the radar chart, or you can actually map the data to multiple chart subcarriers you can do code domain embedding or you can do spatial embedding. Say, for example, um, if your radar is having multiple uh, beams or multiple lobes in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the radiation pattern, then you can use the side lobes to send in communication information and use the main lobe for sensing. Similarly, you can do index modulation. For example, you can use the index of the antenna um, to send information. Uh, but what we are going to talk about is joint design, where, uh, again, I, I just I, I, I would repeat, the, there will be shared hardware between the communication and sensing units. Uh, they will operate at the same frequency. The key challenge here is waveform design. So um, basically, this waveform design is done by suitable spatial recording 
at the transmitter. Uh, and the objective here is to jointly optimize the communication performance and the radar performance. Uh, communication performance can be typically measured in terms of the Shannon capacity and the radar, part, uh, there is no unique measure for radar performance, but the two popular ones are basically, uh, either you use the estimation, location estimation error, uh, such as mean square error or Kramer law lower bound for target localization. This is a valid metric for radar performance. The other one could be uh, the a measure of, info, of, of the information that the radar is uh, able to gather from the received signal about the target. So this is basically some kind of mutual information between the uh, channel quality between the target and the radar and the received signal. So uh, if you are using analog array, then it's also possible that you can use multiple uh, beams. There you can use one or more sub beams for communication and you can have scanning sub beams for, sub -beams for sensing, which keeps scanning the, uh, the entire field of view. And this improves the field of view of sensing. So DFRC, this joint design has many advantages over uh, the radar centric or communication centric designs because uh, depending on your requirement, uh, you can actually tailor the tune the system uh, uh, for a particular application scenario. Now I will briefly explain uh, one piece of work that we have done recently uh, on um, security in intelligent reflecting surface assisted DFRC systems. And then after this, I will talk about some uh, interesting research problems uh, in this specific domain of DRC, uh, DFRC. So uh, we considered the following problem. So you have a radar, um, there are multiple users, mobile users, and there are multiple targets. Uh, some of these targets are actually having direct line of sight path from the radar and others are having indirect paths. Uh, others cannot have uh, LOS path because there is a blockage. Now, in order to facilitate communication and in order to facilitate the detection of this uh, of these hidden targets, uh, we are using one intelligent reflecting surface. Now, each of these targets are also uh, acting as eavesdroppers. They want to decode what is being transmitted to these users. And the radar or the DFRC unit does not want that. So what we have done is we have actually taken up the problem of secrecy rate maximization in this setting. Uh, basically, the idea here is that uh, the radar, when it sends the communication signal to these users, uh, it adds some artificially generated noise and does beamforming. Like it basically does some pre-coding. On top of that, the intelligent reflecting surface also does passive beamforming. And they are done in such a way that the communication signals are focused on the de desired users and the artificial noise that is added to the radar signal, uh, to the communication signal uh, is actually focused at the targets. Now this artificial noise is used by the, uh, to detect the targets. So it's, it doesn't go complete waste, but uh, this artificial noise does not affect the users because they, they are being formed at two, dif two different directions. Uh, so this was published in ICAST 22 and recently we have done uh, another piece of work where basically we have extended this idea to covert communication setting uh, where that uh, these uh, targets uh, they, they, they first of all they, they should not be able to decode the transmission but we are, we are actually having a string, uh, more uh, stronger requirement. The requirement here is that these targets should not even be able to detect that there is a con communication between the radar and the users. And we have, we have designed the algorithms for that setting also. Uh, though we have solved these problems, there are many uh, interesting problems in security of DFRC. Say, for example, in the previous setup itself, uh, we have added artificial noise uh, to the communication signal, but you know, uh, I mean, that's not a good approach because it's waste of power. So can we design the waveform in such a way that we can avoid this artificial noise generation? Uh, then how can we handle jamming? There, there are many works on this. So basically you can either use spread spectrum techniques or frequency hopping techniques, or you can use intelligent reflecting surface. There could be other options as well. Uh, the environment is typically, uh, you know, uh, highly dynamic because users and targets, they can be moving 
and so the question is how to handle unknown and highly dynamic channels uh, another interesting question is if you are operating in wide band regime then uh, how to handle beam squint and, and other such issues so another interesting idea is basically inter imparting more intelligence to the dfrc unit so for example uh, we all address maneuvering targets, but suppose the target is intelligent and it's maneuvering intelligently to, to avoid being caught by the radar. So then how will, how will you handle such issues? So you need some kind of adaptive beamforming or waveform design for the DFRC at, at, in, this, uh, in this case. And there might exist game theoretic solutions. So basically because both agents are intelligent, the radar and the target both are intelligent. Uh, how will you handle multiple highly mobile users? Perhaps you can use OTFS signaling uh, or you can have multiple tracking beams for the communication users. It's not clear yet. Uh, if you have large number of communication users and targets, uh, then uh, basically, and, and of all of them are actually, actually moving, then you can, you how will you perform beam scheduling? Because that's a very important thing. If you have multiple beams and you want to schedule those beams, how will you do that? Because uh, you have to learn or you have to predict where the users and the targets will be. So a lot of learning will be involved here. Uh, another interesting issue is energy saving. So um, in case you can figure out that some of the power amplifiers in your uh, RF chain, I mean, can, can be sh uh, shut down or turned off uh, temporarily. Uh, so then probably you can save a lot of power. And the question is, how can you do it intelligently? There, there is another interesting area, which is basically find, uh, characterizing fundamental performance limits for these DFRC systems. By this, I mean the, I mean the following. So before going this, uh, we have to understand that we need some kind of um, good performance metrics for sensing and communication. And preferably, they should be, it should be a common performance metric. Uh, say, for example, as I said earlier, you can use mutual information for sensing, or you can use mean squared error or tremor drive lower bound. All those things are fine. But the communication uh, performance metric is based always the Shannon data, Shannon capacity or the data rate that you are getting. Now, um, recently in a paper, uh, Ashutosh Savarwal and his group, uh, they have considered uh, joint imaging and communication in a cellular network setting. It's not DFRC, but those ideas can be imported to DFRC setting as well. So they came up with the idea, with the notion of certain degree of freedom uh, which can co jo common, jointly characterize the performance of imaging and communication. So this is an interesting idea, and I think uh, similar ideas can be brought into the DFRC setting as well. Uh, now, given that we come up with such a metric, the next question is, uh, can we characterize the fundamental performance limits for DFRC? Uh, more specifically, can we design some kind of network information theory for DFRC systems? where we have max channel, we have broadcast, we have multicast, relay, etc. But along with that, you have radars, radar, radar sensing. Now, it might turn out that um, the problems are trivial, but to my understanding, it's not that. I mean, uh, the presence of radar actually changes these problems and new theory is required to handle these things. Uh, the next question is how to achieve these limits. Then there are network related issues. Say, for example, if you have a large number of DFRC users in a particular region and they form a network, uh, then how will you manage interference? Uh, at the file layer, you can do interference cancellation or you can use helper nodes and intelligent reflecting surfaces. But at phi and mac layer, you can do more. You can do transmission beam scheduling. You can do design protocols accordingly. Uh, the challenge here is that you need distributed solutions. Uh, you, but 12, but at the same time, you have incomplete channel knowledge, uh, not only about yourself, but also about the other nodes in the system. The environment is very dynamic. Uh, and some of the speakers have actually spoken about these things earlier, when you have channel aging and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. You don't have uh, perfect channel information. Uh, another interesting problem area is basically macro scale performance analysis of these algorithms, of, of the protocols or the algorithms that you have implemented. Uh, specifically spatio-temporal analysis. For example, if you have a large network, uh, can we say something about the uh, par, uh, the, the bit, bit rate per, per second, bits per second per unit area in the system? Can we say something about the 
uh, mean squared estimation error of the uh, of the radar unit uh, per unit area can we say something about some kind of outage performance for communication and sensing so these are very interesting questions and these are not uh, largely not have has not been addressed uh, by uh, by researchers there are some other interesting scenarios one is full, if you have a full duplex ra radio then you have to encounter the problem of self interference cancellation uh, here basically the one big issue is that the reflected signal from the target uh, is received by the full duplex ratio so you have to be careful like when you cancel the interference uh, interference is different from the reflected signal that you are getting from the target uh, then uh, you have uh, we have to do beam, beam and transmission scheduling in a network scenario and a lot of issues will come up there as well the last point that i would like to make is uh, basically as you increase the aperture of your antenna and as you increase and and more on top of that if you use intelligent reflecting surface basically you are going to operate in a large aperture regime and um, if your operating frequency also increases the carrier frequency increases that means you are operating at, at a small wavelength so this increases the front of our distance and as a result your communication becomes near field communication it's not far field uh, so here you in, uh, you can't model the wavefront as a planar wavefront you have spherical wavefront uh, which is uh, more complicated to handle but if you can handle well it can give you useful information about the target because it helps uh, in range uh, in res uh, resolving two targets not only in the angle domain but also in the range domain but addressing such problems require uh, sound knowledge of electromagnetism not only traditional communication and signal processing theory um, but this is a very interesting area you can use holographic antenna relate uh, and similar such technologies there can be a lot of interesting problems in designing uh, you know waveform beamforming and polarization uh, for the dfrs uh, for the signal that you are transmitting for communication and radar so i think it's a very interesting area so with this i would like to conclude and i will be happy to take any question Thank you so much, Professor Arpan. Uh, especially for me personally, I was not very much aware of the of the sensing field as such. So this was very helpful and it gave me a lot of perspective on uh, how things work. Uh, thank you so much. I'll just take a question here. Um, yeah, how need what needs to be done for radar standards coexistence with uh, LTE, 5G, 6G? Uh, so can you repeat that? So let me see. It's not very clear to me the way it is written, but I'll try it again. Um, uh, what needs to be done in the, for the radar standards to coexist with LTE, 5G, or 6G? So are there separate standards defined for radar? So how do how to how 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 is it uh, helpful or what needs to be done for them to coexist with each other? That is the question. Uh, honestly speaking, I'm not very clear about that. But there are some radar standards, as I as I mentioned, it's eight, I mean uh, where, for DFRC also 802.11 uh, AD. Uh, but I don't know specifically about how it is being handled in 5G or 6G. So okay. I mean I, I can't clearly answer this question. Maybe some other experts can answer this. I, I personally don't actually uh, look at standards that much. Okay. Uh, um, Devaki or Ashok, would you like to take this question, if possible? Yeah, I can give a shot. So, see, as of now, LTE, 5G or 6G, there is no radar support or coexistence discussed as is. Okay. So, there are maybe bands in CBRS kind of bands where there is some way of coexistence using some other uh, indirect mechanism, not in the signal processing mechanism that, uh, that the professor is talking about here. So maybe for 6G is a thing that people would be interested in making this coexist and make it even feasible, uh, sensing as an example. But as of now, there is no coexistence of radar and uh, 6G from signal processing viewpoint. Thank you. Okay, I think that's all we have for uh, in terms of questions. But uh, thank you so much, Professor Arpan. That that was very helpful and it was a very insightful presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I'm supposed to be <laughs> providing some closing remarks now. 
uh, I know we are running late already, so I'll just take a couple of minutes to um, kind of thank everyone and um, yeah. Thank you. So many thanks to all of our distinguished speakers for uh, you know taking the time to join the session. It has been very insightful. Uh, we learned a lot about how you know 6G cellular networks can shape up based on the things we've learned from our experts and how research aspects and things can contribute towards it. Um, and uh, thank you very much for all the participants who, who have joined us on this session as well. Uh, so I'll briefly touch upon a few points from each of the uh, uh, speakers. So Professor uh, Kiran Kuchi uh, really summarized very well on how some of the key technologies can be used to achieve ubiquitous connectivity, like you know um, having new waveforms that can provide power, power efficiency. And then there was this large, um, extremely large antenna arrays which provide um, better with throughputs or faster speeds. Um, then he also proposed a chain of relays like uh, next generation of integrated access and backhaul networks, which can provide better connectivity for uh, especially rural areas where connectivity is scarce or um, difficult. So uh, yeah, he talked about those points and uh, Ms. Devaki, um, it was very, very helpful and uh, she talked about how metaverse um, as an industry, uh, metaverse can help industri industrial automation as well as um, how it can be deployed at scale. And we are closer to achieving that um, than compared to the consumer metaverse. So, and she's also talked about um, how, what 3GPP uh, is working on and how 3GPP um, perspective um, uh, standardization has uh, gotten into and how uh, where where it will go forward in the near future thank you so much for bringing that uh, perspective as well um professor nilesh uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to explain it so well uh, uh, about hyper reliable low latency communications and how they interact with um, embb systems and things like that it was uh, very helpful for me to understand at the physical layer aspects and things like that uh, I, especially considering my not so much knowledge about that um, and Mr. Ashok, uh, that uh, your slide set and the way uh, the topics that you covered, it was um, it was eye opening to me personally because you talked about a lot of uh, AI ML systems and how they could integrate uh, between communication uh, within the communication system to you know provide a revolutionary system uh, going forward for six G. Um, yeah, that was that was uh, super informative. Thank you, and uh, Professor Arpan, Arpan, uh, thank you so much. Um, even though I was not very familiar with the radar and sensing aspect of things, you brought in a very good perspective on how radar and sensing can be integrated with the existing communication systems. So it has been an overall very engaging session. Uh, Thank you all. We uh, truly appreciate all your efforts and uh, time towards the presentations. Thanks a lot. Um, one closing thought I have personally is that, uh, especially in India, both academia and industry, we have to work towards to push ourselves more into standardization related activities because a lot of research activities has been going on and uh, not all of it go into the standardization aspects like 3GPP or ITU or um, or IEEE or TSDSI. So it would be really nice to see um, more uh, involvement in the global standardization bodies, especially from India. Um, and uh, I'd also like to thank my co-chair, uh, Mr. VK Roy, as well as um, the session convener, Mr. Rajesh Kapoor, uh, to help organize this event and um, make it a success. Thank you so much, Chandrakanta and other TSDSI Secretariat folks. Uh, you guys helped a lot uh, to make this session hopefully a success. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you.